um, Tacitus' work was uh, actually lost, almost. Where did Tacitus actually get this information from? And theories are endless. Several scholars do not think, even if there was an authentic core, that we can even retrieve that core. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Does Tacitus have independent knowledge of the historical Jesus, or is he dependent on some other information? Today, I have a special guest, Chrissy Hansen. Welcome back to Myth Vision. Hi, it's been a while. It has, and the last time you came on, you did this, honestly, I didn't even expect unbelievable deep dive into this history of mythicism. So if you're mm -hmm. interested in seeing that development, we do have the video. Uh, it's a few years old, it seems, a year and a half or so. And More than that, I think that was back in 2020. <laughs> wow, it's been that long. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did a fantastic job. You have this great memory um, all off the head. You were just going into the history and taking us through all the way to contemporary times with mythicism. And this topic today that you're going to discuss is actually somewhat re related in the whole historical Jesus question. So before we do dive in, you wrote this article. Tell us about your background, what you're researching, a little bit about yourself as we introduce your article. Awesome. So, uh, for those who don't know, then uh, I am a researcher, mostly a. Uh, I describe myself mostly as a hobbyist um, in biblical studies. I don't have any advanced credentials in the field, but I do have a rather in a significant number of publications in it now. Um, by the end of this year, I should have over twenty peer-reviewed publications, most of which are all to do with. Jesus studies, um, early Christian uh, martyrdom and uh, persecution narratives, and also stepping into um, other fields as well. One of my, uh, the book project I'm now working on I, that I have contracted with Whitman's talk is going to be all on whether or not Philemon is authentic. Um, so lots of different stuff there. I also research Tolkien studies and have a paper published on that um, and a few other different topics. So I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, it's just whatever fits my interests in the moment. Um, I am currently a grad student at University of Nebraska at Kearney and uh, studying English. My background is primarily very conservative Christian. I was raised in the pre-Methodist church uh, initially, my family had been a part of the Free Methodist Church since the 1890s um, and come from a long line of pastors and theologians. I left the faith when, after I started college, probably my second year um, is when I basically stopped attending church for the most part. My last bid was, was Catholicism, actually. Um, I considered converting and was talking with a priest about it for a while. Um, so yeah, uh, my current background is that I am a polytheist. Um, that is a whole different journey that we do not have time for, but that is essentially where I'm at. So uh, I came to doing my paper on Tacitus at first, specifically because I wanted to talk about Tacitus in relation to the historical Jesus. Um, and then it just completely grew beyond that. And then I launched into a com into early Christian martyrdom and persecution narratives instead. You're writing some fantastic stuff. I've been enjoying seeing you write not only on social media with some of the arguments that are made here and there on some of these groups, but also in these articles. So the article that you have today right now is on Tacitus and really the question of where did he get his information about Jesus, Christians, and such, which takes us straight into this early, I guess you'd say apologetic, anti-apologetic arena that is definitely used online. Uh, many of the Christian apologists will reference these sources to go, here's proof that Jesus existed. Now, 
I want to phrase it this way, because as we get into this article, I want you to tell us about the different positions and how you have kind of tackled these and come to a conclusion. But mm-hmm. I also want to mention, like, you're not a mythicist. You no. think there was most likely a Jesus. However, um, you're still taking a position that I think most people tend to go, hey, they use this as a tool to prove or argue that Jesus existed. Yeah. Yeah, I am uh, definitely a historicist. A lot of my publications are specifically uh, taking on different mythicist positions. And um, I... What's interesting is that even though I'm not a mythicist, when it comes to the vast majority of what they talk about, I, for the most part, agree. Um, I don't think uh, Tacitus is a good, or any of the extra biblical sources are actually useful for establishing the historicity of Jesus. Um, I don't think any of the references in Josephus are actually authentic. Um, Additionally, I do not uh, think that the Gospels can be taken as historical sources for reconstructing Jesus's life in any regard, and I tend to be uh, more on the mimesis criticism end of things with Dennis McDonald and uh, Richard C. Miller and others like that. So it's, uh, I I am very much uh, of the opinion that uh, mythicists, for the most part, have been actually, in my opinion, ahead of the curve on a lot of stuff. you go back all the way into the 1800s, Bruno Bauer and others like that are already proposing that the Gospels are stemming from uh, Stoic and Platonist ideas, and they're just being completely um, discarded by most scholars of their era. Mm. Um, And now scholars are coming back around like, "Mm, no, actually, there's definitely a lot of Stoic and Platonist influence on in the New Testament. So, where I'm coming from is certainly not an apologetic standpoint. I really honestly don't care if Jesus existed. Um, a, a piece of writing I'm working on right now is my argument that I don't think the historical Jesus is even relevant for understanding Christian origins. So whether he existed or not is to me a complete side issue and of very little historical consequence. Um, but when it comes to Tacitus, there's still that debate, and it's still a huge debate within um, Jesus studies, and especially with those with those apologists you mentioned. They really want to use Tacitus as this great and imbue him with great care as a historian, make him one of these amazing, well, uh, like uncharacteristically scrupulous for his time. It's strange, but it's not something that even originates with apologists. It stems um, mostly out of um, early and mid 20th century work that really promoted Tacitus as this great historian. And it's something that's kind of been inherited over time. Um, Tacitus's work was uh, actually lost, almost. Um, The fact that we have what we have is kind of a miracle because during the reign, the during around the third and fourth centuries, actually his work was in fairly poor repute. Very few people were actually using it and citing it. And it actually, but uh, one emperor who claimed to be a descendant of his ended up having to uh, instantiate an attempt to actually revive and recopy his work because manuscripts were in poor condition. They weren't being reused very much. Hmm. Um, And in fact, it's also the case that they weren't even always aware of all of his works. So some uh, writers like Tertullian and others do cite Tacitus, but they only cite his histories. They don't cite the annals, Um, which makes it very clear that these works were not all in equal circulation. And they also were not in that great repute. So it's not until much later, and I think partially on the basis of Annals chapter 15, uh, part 44, or book 15, chapter 44, my bad, uh, is that it, that section on Jesus, I think, is probably one of the major reasons why his repute has been consistently uh, revived and promoted since then. Uh, spe- around the 
uh, fifth, uh, fourth and fifth centuries, we finally see his work being revived again, and then he's finally cited on the persecution of Christians by um, Sulpicius Severus. Wow. So he he's cited on the persecution of Christians later. Uh, you wrote another article I'm sure we'll tiptoe into just to tease people, but we will have another episode where we're going to actually discuss that particular issue, which I loved Candida Moss's book, uh, The Myth of Persecution. I actually teared up reading a section about one of the female, uh, I can't remember the name in the Greek world, where she actually was tricked by her king father uh, into being married, but really didn't, and they were sacrificing her to get the wind to blow so their ships could leave harbor or something. You, you would know probably that I would, more than I would. But uh, <laughs> anyway, a great book. Um, but this question of Tacitus, there are several hypotheses, if I could put it that way, of like how yeah. he got Christian ideas. How does he know about these Christians? How does he know about Jesus? And they they range from this guy, like, in fact, has like the most higher upper echelon documentation from the courts. So this is good stuff. This is like you can't get any more historically accurate information to this guy is borrowing from Josephus to a hypothesis that you propose. And so I don't want to say it yet. I want you to, to elaborate on what are the hypotheses? Which ones have things going for them more than others? And then let's let's nail this one down. Yeah, so the first half of my paper on Tacitus is actually dealing with all these previous theories you mentioned on where did Tacitus actually get this information from? And theories are endless. People speculate about this all over the place. One of the more prominent ones that's been coming up a little bit recently, it's been uh, promoted as possible by Steve Mason, uh, by Dave Allen, and it was also uh, in the past um, argued for by um, Franz Dorn Dornseif in his article, uh, Lucas der Schriftsteller uh, mit einem Anhang Josephus und Tacitus. Uh, this is assen the essential argument is that we can point out some pretty close parallels uh, in their opinions between Tacitus's text on Jesus, specifically what he says about Jesus, and also what Josephus writes in the Testimonium Flavianum. Now, this is a tricky argument because one major problem is it is entirely hinged on whether or not we know anything about the Testimonium Flavianum and it can be reconstructed accurately. Several scholars do not think that we, even if it was uh, there was an authentic core, that we can even retrieve that core. And you can see why, because there's several different ways to reconstruct it. Alice Wheely thinks that almost the entire thing is authentic. Ulrich Victor and Samuel Zinner think the entire thing is authentic. Uh, and then you have, you know, like, jo like uh, John P. Meyer, who argued for a neutral original and excises various passages like he was the Christ and stuff like that. And then you have a, another subgroup, Dave Allen, uh, Fernando Bermejo Rubio, and others, who are arguing that instead it was a negative uh, testimonium, but even between all of these different neutral, positive, and negative reconstructions, there's sub-reconstructions within each of these groups. No one agrees on how to reconstruct this passage, really. Um, John Myers is probably the most popular way of doing that, but that's come under some scrutiny. Um, again, Wheelie critiques it, Ken Olson has very vociferously critiqued it, and I actually agree with him that it's probably completely inauthentic with no core. Um, so it is hinged on some real, rather problematic uh, assumptions to begin with, but it gets even worse. You go and you actually look at these parallels and you realize these are really general points. Like anything that Tacitus says looks almost identical to what you could find in like a Christian creedal statement. And Ken Olson elsewhere pointed out actually a very close uh, specific summation that's actually in Justin Martyr's work, uh, almost identical as well. So you can very easily see that this could come from anywhere. Hmm. Um, what also is problematic is that 
there's no evidence that Tacitus ever used Josephus's antiquities. The arguments for his reliance on uh, on Josephus are primarily from the Jewish War and with regard to Tacitus's work, the Histories, in chapters four and five. When we look at those parallels, there are some that line up somewhat closely, and Steve Mason has argued for them uh, in more detail in other works. I don't buy them personally. There's also some substantial differences, like they don't agree on who kills various figures. They don't agree on the numbers of the dead who perish in the siege. All, in fact, anytime numbers come up, Tacitus and Josephus never agree. And there's also other things, like in the very same passage in the histories, Tacitus talks about the origins of uh, the Jewish people, and nothing he says you can find you can find anywhere in Josephus. But you know where you can find those origin stories in other Greco-Roman sources. It doesn't look like, in my opinion, he's using Josephus. And on top of it, Roman authors hated Josephus. Um, this is a point that hmm. uh, Ken Olson brought up. Uh, I also, uh, and he pointed uh, to Suetonius, and I. Th there's also a reference in uh, Cassius Dio as well. It's just no one would probably utilize Josephus without saying something really negative things about him because they usually do. Anytime he pops up, they don't have nice things to say. They, they kind of just think of him as like a as like attaching himself to Vespasian. Like he's like clamoring at his heels and is it's not a good picture at all and they don't like jewish people in general they only have awful things to say about jewish people all the time hmm. sounds like not a lot has changed in the world no um in fact a lot of the anti-semitic polemics that we have today come from roman polemics as well um wow like it and you'll see also some parallels with polemics Romans would use with Christians. Also, Justin Sledge actually talked about this in one of his videos, um, that a lot of Christian anti-Semitic polemics originate with anti-Christian polemics Romans used against them. Uh, it's really interesting. There's a lot of stock utilization of insults and stereotypes that are uh, frequently engaged with. So in my opinion, that pretty much dispels the testimony of Flavianum. We don't know what it originally said. I don't think that even if it was authentic, we can re reconstruct it. And I'm not alone. RT France, E.P. Sanders, and most recently Margaret Williams all agree on this point as well. And in addition to all of that, the parallels don't really work. And those parallels that really, that are the closest are with the Jewish war. As we know from the history of Tacitus's works, just because you know one work doesn't mean you know the other. Just because someone knows the Jewish war does not mean that they had access to antiquities. That re yet remains to be proven. Um, Tacitus's own work was much the same way as I just described. O people only really knew his histories. They did not know the annals was a thing. Right for a long time. So moving on from there, there are other theories like uh, different official sources. And this one's really popular among um, apologists in particular. You get people like Gary Habermas and others who really want to argue, you know, he definitely had access to these archival materials. Uh, Pilate probably sent in a report of some kind and Christians say there was a report um, you know, he had to be recalled to by Tiberius, so I, maybe there was an investigation. Who knows? There's, and there, they usually point to two principal sources: the Acta Senatus, which was uh, daily, uh, basically an account of uh, the deeds of the Senate, and then the uh, Commentary uh, Principis, which was a, a the official um, imperial commentary. Um, that Caesar had access to, along with probably a few other very, very high up officials. There are problems with all of these. 
Um, Rihanna Nash um, actually points out, as, as well as others, that the act of senatus actually increasingly becomes useless for Tacitus as his work progresses. Um, he cites it less. He doesn't cite it very much to begin with. Um, and by the time we get to book 15, it just stops popping up, really. Um, so, and in addition, it's deeds of the Senate, the chances of there being mention of some random Galilean preacher being executed are just about non-existent. This was, this is what I wanted to ask you on that was <laughs> this point. And, and it's like, do we even have any evidence of any of these sources that Habermas is hoping, you know, he's hoping that he had access to something and wasn't copying someone else's, you know, work or using other ideas to fill in for Jesus and Christian ideas or origins of where these guys come from and who are they? Is there any evidence in any of these sources being mentioned here that we know of that mention Christians? That why would he? Why no. my point is like why is he saying this? Is this one of those like well we don't have it, so we can't prove there it? There is. Yeah, no, there's there's nothing. Uh, there is no record of any of these official Roman sources ever mentioning Christians. And it would not be surprising if they didn't. In fact, it's probably likely that they didn't. Okay. Um, because there's just nothing to report. Uh, who are, There are a bunch of random people. They're at best a group of, you know, 200 people in any given city who are just random uh, sectarians that no one cares about and at most at the very most they're just a public nuisance that don't pay taxes that's yeah. it that's like that's that's all you have to go on um, and it's very evident that there wasn't uh, much official record on this at all because Pliny had no official record and Pliny is writing not long before Tacitus is um, at this point Pliny writes his letter to the Emperor Trajan. This is from um, Book 10 of his Epistolae. Um, it's uh, Epistle 96, if I recall. Um, Pliny basically is right, and he's like, hey, I don't know what to do with these people. I have not sat on any trials. I don't have any official records. I don't have any legislation, nothing. He has nothing to go on and has to uh, uh, ask Trajan, like, what do I do with these people? Uh, what I've, this is what I've been doing, trying to figure out more about them. Here's what my report on what I figured out. And mostly all he can come up with is they worship someone as a god, quasi Dio. They uh, are not paying their taxes and the temples are uh, becoming destitute because too many people are not actually uh, going to temple anymore. And this is very clearly what his main concern is, is that Christians are not upholding their end of the social bargain. Right. Um, it is expected of everyone in the Roman Empire, you pay your taxes and you do your dues to Caesar. And if you don't, you're a problem. That's what you do. That's the law. Um, so... He's not really targeting Christians specifically because they're Christian. He's targeting them because they're breaking the law. He would have done this to anyone. Um, and there are other religious groups that they also grabbed under being um, fault, under false asso or improper associations and illegal associations as well, like Druids and the the and uh, a few other subgroups. Uh, there's, but anyways, he's. He clearly doesn't know anything. If there were these official records available, and Pliny was a very high up official, you would think that he would have access to them. Mm -hmm. But you go to the act, but what, looking at the act of Senatus again, there's basically no reason to think that Jesus would appear in that at all. This was like a day, uh, this was basically recording just like the legislative actions and a few other, and, and other things like that, that the Senate took, which had no bearing on Judea. Judea was beyond the auspices of the Senate that was by, run by the regional governors. So the idea that there is anything in there from Jesus just seems ludicrous to me. And 
I'm not the only one. This is basically the opinion of uh, Robert Van Borst and just about every other commentator on this text. The one that becomes more debated is the commentary principis. This is a, the, you know, the official record that uh, was being, that looks like it was mostly the domain of Caesar. We get this impression because it's mentioned in Tacitus' text, if I recall, only once. And the context is there was a conspiracy and the Senate wants access to figure out who the rest of the co-conspirators were. Domitian, who is not emperor yet, said, basically says, I don't think that I have access to this, so I have to wait till the emperor returns. Um, and if I remember correctly at the time, this is Vespasian. There's essentially, he's saying that they, the implication we get, it's not explicitly stated, but it is heavily implied by this text. They don't have regular access to this text hmm. without imperial permission. For, and even um, then, like, th does this imperial... And even, yeah, and even then, why would it mention Jesus? Right. Is this you an, think is that it, do you feel going like to mention an, the random execution of some nobody in Judea? It, it like what is this going? Is this just cataloging every last single random person the Roman Empire executed on a daily basis? I mean, they're executing probably people by the hundreds every week. Right. They are not recording some random prophet in Judea. I mean. The, the case, the case in point of this is that if they actually were recording details of these r people leading uprisings or these random prophets, you'd think they would have remembered the Egyptian's name. Right. He was far, more, he had a far more impressive following than Jesus did, and with far more lofty goals that required a military in intervention. And they can't even recall his name. You think they remember Jesus? No. There's no reason to think that Jesus would have ever been mentioned in any of these official texts at all. This is also coming to another problem, which is that Tacitus cites no source here. There is nothing cited for any of these claims. Why? probably because he didn't see any need to cite a source, but that means that we just have no idea where he's getting this um, in explicitly. When you look at uh, his writing techniques, Tassus very rarely cites sources. The idea that he carefully cites sources, that he's this very careful historian doing all the special archival research is nonsense. As Margaret Williams notes, Ar doing archival research is not what ancient historians did. They rarely ever did so. Suetonius is actually the exception. He is, Suetonius has actually been going through a bit of a revival in terms of his work lately, as Margaret Williams uh, discusses, but he does some archival work. Tacitus, no, he's not going into Roman archives and stuff. He's mostly reliant on a, other literary sources, and B, hearsay. And he's reliant on a lot of hearsay. His work, Germania, is virtually all hearsay and occasionally firsthand uh, accounts from Romans who went there. But let's be real, probably not reliable on what the, what the German and Gallic tribes were like. Yeah, like that's not um, going to have some propagandistic... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just fact, like his views of Christians. I mean, you know, you're going to get... But that is probably the perception that they had, which is something that is important yeah. as you're when you start to connect this to to your where you think he gets his ideas. Yeah, he's just not a he's not he's not this special careful historian that everyone just likes pretending that he is. Um, David uh, Potter and others have all discussed this at some length. Um, like for example. Um, uh, A.J. Woodman and R.H. Martin, they wrote, 
Tacitus is no exception to the general rule that ancient historians refer to their sources only with relative infrequency. When they do so, it is often a means of corroborating matters which might provoke surprise, skepticism, or controversy with their readers. In short, Tacitus doesn't cite sources because unless there is a reason, unless he's saying something he needs to really convince you of, which usually he doesn't, he's not going to. That's just not how ancient Roman historians worked. Um, and when he does cite sources, it's very often vague. Again, uh, to, to quote Woodman and Martin again, references to nameless auctores are a, a particularly effective in circumstances in, the, in such circumstances uh, to corroborate a writer's potentially challenged claims because they enhance the writer's authority but cannot be checked. And that's the thing. Even when he, cite, when he cites things like the act of Senatus, what specifically is he citing? What edition? What publication? Is, is that implied? That no one this, else. Does that mean that Tacitus is bringing, when, when he doesn't source it and he just quotes it or he just mentions it but doesn't say where he gets it from, is that an act in the liter in the writer's perspective of authority themselves? Like you don't need me to give you the source where I got this from. You could just trust me, and that's what the point of yes. that quote was. Yes, it is. Okay. It, it it is it is in uh, it granting authority to yourself because you're saying I know this material. You can trust my material. You don't have and in some respects, even include including a lot of citations in your work was considered kind of bad form. It doesn't look nice. It's not aesthetically, because you also have to remember that these works are organized and written with thematic cores and goals in mind. And they're also written to be recited. We know this. Uh, Pliny recounts reciting his, offic his official works. His, th this is essentially what publishing was in that day. You wrote your work, you polished it up, you got some feedback from maybe a trusted source, we'll get to that. And then you presented it to your to a, this a core audience of people and had it read and had it read and presented probably depending on length probably over the course of a few days and such. And then after that, that's published. There it is. It goes into a library. That is that 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 is essentially what we're working with here. And so you're not going to, like, citing a whole bunch of sources and stuff, it interrupts the flow of the work. You are working predominantly in an oral culture. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, it doesn't make help the thematic flow at all. It interrupts things with, oh, uh, he says so-and-so, so-and-so says X, uh, this person says Y, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also... When you want to say, when you want to try and validate a particular skeptical claim, the being vaguer is better. Right. Saying the authors, the, the, the famous historians and authors support me on this, but not saying which ones is much more effective than say, than specifically citing some guy and then he turns out not to say what you claim he said. Mm. So, okay, we have really started sifting into this Tacitus thing. The real question then is, he's got this Christian material. Where did he get it, Chrissy? I mean, did he just, did Jesus hand him a letter? Did a UFO fly down from heaven and give it to the guy? I mean, what, <laughs> did he, and, and you mentioned this too, like, did he investigate Christians while he was ruling over here? You know, uh, we don't know that, but like, is there, what is the most plausible, based on your research, explanation for how he has this in his writings? So my argument is specifically that I think he's getting it from Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger is the only of previous Roman source we know that ever mentions Christians, and he mentions them in a way that gives the implication that Romans didn't know who these people were. He had knows of no prior trials or, or um, uh, 
uh, any persecutions or anything like that. He's functioning completely in the blind. He has to figure out and re and explain who they're even worshiping because not even that much was known. <laughs> now there is one other suggestion. I won't get into it, but it's I I discount it kind of out of hand. Uh, John Granger Cook argues maybe Tacitus and Suetonius are relying on uh, a lo on lost literary sources and there's no evidence of that. The only real evidence we have is Pliny. And this comes from a number of different uh, arenas. So the first and the most significant is that we have tons of letters that Pliny wrote. You read through books one through nine, and he mentions or writes to Tacitus numerous times. He solicits... Um, uh, and we also have Tacitus soliciting him for information. At one point, Tacitus wants information about the death of Pliny's uh, uncle, Pliny the Elder, who died uh, in, on a ship when Mount Vesuvius erupted. He was right in the area, and he was trying to survey the uh, eruption. Hmm. So Tacitus wanted information on that. We know Tacitus solicited information. We know that he also sent his work to be edited and checked by uh, Pliny, uh, specifically because we know that Pliny specifically says that he's sending Tacitus's historical work back to him with notes. We also know that Pliny and Tacitus were fairly close, and on top of this, we also know that Pliny and Suetonius were fairly close. Suetonius was probably his secretary when he was uh, governor uh, in um, uh, Pontus and Bithynia, i.e. when he was putting Christians on trial. This gives us a lot of good reason. Just It, it might be circumstantial, but just from, these, from, from that alone, we already have pretty good reason to think this. But not only this, we know that that Tacitus used other letters and also other works of Pliny's. This has been argued and pretty much a consensus for quite a long time, as Margaret Williams notes, that we know that he was using some of his orations and rhetorical works. And then uh, in the uh, Cambridge Companion to Tacitus, if I remember correctly, there's even uh, someone who makes a very substantial argument that he was aware of other letters of Pliny's and uses them in other spots. Now, some have averred about this. Um, if I remember correctly, J.P. Holding argues that he's um, taking it, that at some places he's taking a jab at Pliny the Younger, but they're wrong. It's actually Pliny the Elder he's jabbing at. So that alone is already some pretty decent reason. So we have, we have a, a buddy of the killer, using using a detective analogy, um, who shoots a gun a certain way. They've gone out hunting together. They're trained with the weapon. Um, you know, they've oftentimes they had a lot in common when it comes to these things. And then you come to find out in the passage back to Tacitus. The perception of Christians seems to be very similar to what we're seeing over here in Pliny and what we see with, with Tacitus. And that the descriptions of what Christians were, what they believed, who these people were, that kind of stuff, there's overlap. So you even have the, the murder being somewhat similar over here, uh, going back to this whole analogy thing. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, essentially, they, yeah, well, as you said, they have very similar attitudes towards Christians, um, very similar uh, agendas here as well. Um, I think when it comes to this, the most concrete piece that really fits these two together is identical language. The, 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 not only do they shoot the gun the same way, not only do they have similar way, 
not only do they uh, fit like a glove because of their close connections, we have means, we have motive, and we have opportunity. They have similar grammatical overlap. They bought their bullets from the same store and the shells are yeah. found like, at, the, at the crime scene. Yeah. They both describe, they both explicitly describe their, the, um, Christians as a superstit, superstitio. Uh, Tacitus writes, is his superstitio, um, rursum. And then we have, uh, Pliny. It's a, where he has a, a, um, a problem. So they both call it a contagion or a disease on society. They both despise it. Hmm. This is where thing, and this is where things also get interesting. Is you know, Pliny describes Jesus as quasi Deo, which means they worship um, Jesus as if he's a god. You compare that with Tacitus; they worship this man Jesus, uh, or this man Christus. Both of them only know Jesus by the title Christus as well. Hmm. All of it just really perfectly lines up almost you have you have verbatim overlaps you have uh you have me you have um tacitus and pliny being close friends exchanging work with each other pliny explicitly editing tacitus's work offering feedback tacitus solicits information from pliny on occasion this is stronger evidence than any other speculative uh, and conjectured origin point. None other has this has this many correlations for where Tacitus got his information. So the question is, where does the Neronium persecution reference come from in there? That's the question because Pliny doesn't mention that. We need to get into that in our next episode. Chrissy Hansen, ladies and gentlemen, show her some love in the comment section down below. Go read the article. I'm going to put both of them in the description if you're okay with that, Chrissy. That way, if they watch either of the video, they can access both of those yep. links. Um, this is amazing. I, You've got me pretty persuaded. I mean, I, I don't know the languages and things, but it just... Based on my reading of this, this is, uh, I'm not denying that they couldn't have known something of Josephus or whatever, but like, as you point out in the article, it's honestly irrelevant um, to the case you're making. And I could see why someone who might try to go to Josephus to say it was a negative testimony, and maybe there was something in common, but uh, it's super speculative at this point. It's a hypothesis that doesn't have, you know, the, the the experts, the number one experts on this Josephus issue cannot agree uh, in many ways. So I'm going to go with what you're describing as making the most sense. And I hope that people let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, show some love. Any final words from you on this episode before we get to Nero? Uh, no. All, all I can say is um, thanks for watching. Um, you can find me I have a humanities comments page. I have a public email. So if you want information or you want to ask me questions or anything, hit me up. Um, aside from that, uh, I'll see you next time. All the links are in the description. Go show her some love and never forget, we are MythVision.